Good partners provide choices. Smart partners take some of those choices. Your question, uh, do we have multiple options? Answer is yes. Uh, is that a problem? Why should it be a problem? If I'm smart enough to have multiple options, you should be admiring me. You know, you shouldn't be criticizing. <laughs> Global eyes. The Munich Security Report 2024 suggests building stronger ties with countries in the Global South. It says that countries in the Global South are showing dissatisfaction that the West comes to them whenever it needs, and when they don't need, then they just don't look at Global South. So this is about bringing them together. What the report also says is that G7 countries have a feeling that countries in the Global South are going to be progressing in the next 10 years, and G7 countries are either going to stagnate or be on the decline. So what's causing this change? And where does India stand in this new global order? To discuss that and more, we are together here at Global Eyes. I am Isha Bhatia Sanan. And I am William Glucroft, security reporter for DW. We're going to be looking at these growing differences that the Munich Security Conference and the security establishment looks at, it seems like, year in and year out as crises around the world grow and grow these divisions between what might be known as the West and the rest. And to discuss this, we have Happy Man Jacob. He is columnist. He's a commentator on international diplomacy and associate professor at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Welcome. Thank you. And over to my left is Robin Quinville. She is the director of the Global Europe Program for the Wilson Center. And before that, she was a career diplomat with the US State Department, ending that career, at least for now, at, as the acting ambassador to Germany uh, towards the end of the Trump administration into the Biden administration. Thank you, Robin, for being on Globalize. Thank you for asking me. And uh, we've seen a lot of interesting sessions today. There was one where we had the foreign ministers of India, US, and Germany together. How do you perceive this? What kind of a constellation was that, really? Well, I think that was a fantastic panel in many ways. Therefore, you had the German foreign minister, you had the American secretary of state, and the Indian foreign minister, three powers that are going to be consequential in shaping the world or in many ways going forward. And you had some very interesting conversation um, among the three folks, and I think I particularly remember what um, our foreign minister Jayashankar said about um, multiple choice uh, being the Indian way of uh, uh, making friendships and relationships in the international system. And he went on to say that uh, good friends uh, provide options, uh, good partners provide options, and uh, smart partners take those options. I think, I think that was, that's very, very symbolic of uh, India's foreign policy today, India's diplomacy today. India is not bound to any particular side or any particular alliance or any particular, um, let's say, constellation of powers. India says that we are a side. Uh, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. We are the uh, most populous country on planet Earth. We are a nuclear weapon power. We, count and therefore we have a side. We are our own side. So we don't have to be on your side, on your side, but we can still be friends. So I think that's a great take, 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 take away from that. But do you think India has an equal say? Like you talked about being symbolic. And I had this feeling, I was there, I had this feeling that um, US had a lot to say. Uh, well, my reading was that Jaishankar didn't get as much space. What was your reading? I agree with that. I think there was less input from Jaishankar and there were more I think um, insights from the German foreign minister and the US Secretary of State. He should have been given more time. We, I mean, I wanted to hear more from what uh, from from the foreign minister, but I guess the questions were mostly on Israel and you know Palestine and issues of that kind, where the, perhaps the Germans are uh, in a spot, the Americans are in a spot, and uh, the Indians are not because we sort of in many ways. Uh, uh, in my opinion, taken the right uh, path in sort of calling out what is uh, what is uh, terrorism, what is uh, in some ways um, a question of duplicity, um, uh, a question of moral um, challenge when it comes to Western positions on the question of uh, Palestine. Um, so I, I guess because the questions were such, um, the uh, Indian foreign minister didn't has get much 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 chance to speak. But that's all right. He speaks anyways uh, in, in, in several <laughs> other forums. <laughs> well, I had a feeling the whole thing was extremely symbolic because just before that session, we had a session with the Chinese foreign minister, and he was all alone. 
uh, to me, looking at it from the outside, it looked like um, you have Europe, you have US coming together and showing China you are alone, whether in the session or on the world stage. And India, we need you. You have a bit of a say because we are together. We'll decide how much you say. I mean, it's my interpretation. I'd like to know how do you see it. I didn't read it that way, uh, partly because I've been to a, a Munich Security Conference before, and they generally do have a slot for the Chinese to have a, one, a representative of their government. And you used to sometimes have a slot for the Russian to, uh, to make their statement. And so it's almost like you had a series of bilateral speeches. So I saw it in that context. I actually wanted to hear more from your foreign minister in the discussion. I agree with you. Uh, it partly was the questions that were coming because they also took questions from the floor. But I was, I was intrigued. Mine. I was I'm so <laughs> quite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was listening to this and I thought this is a really interesting mix of, dis of commentary. And like you, I loved the fact that he said, you know, Good partners can choose from these from these things, and the Secretary of State is saying, "Yes, right, we know that." And, the, and mm -hmm. I thought that if that is the way they go forward, that opens up a whole lot more possibilities. And so that is what I liked about that. Would have loved to have heard more. So you can you can <laughs> make that a point for next time. Well, well, what would you have liked to have heard more? Were there, was there anything from on your to-do list from from the Indian Foreign from Minister, from you, from your transatlantic perspective? Uh, I would have liked to have a little sort of future look and say, "Right, okay, this is how we're approaching." alliances and partnerships, right? And this is what we're looking for in the sort of next short and medium term, right? This is how we plan to, to utilize this. I'm not saying, okay, we're gonna pick these cards and play these cards and so forth, but to say these are our goals with those, with those choices and these are the things that we, that we are looking for when we make those choices. And I just thought it would have been a fuller discussion. But again, when you have these, you know, you have only so many minutes, I suppose, but you ha you really could have had an interesting discussion about that would have been informative for the Secretary of State and for the German Foreign Minister about what India is looking for in those choices that it's making. Robin, were you surprised um, of all the issues that are confronting the United States and its European partners, mm -hmm. in this case the Germans, that they chose or they volunteered or they were part of however the this arrangement was created, that they went with an Indian partner to talk with on the stage. Antony Blinken, not exactly a small person you know, <laughs> on the world stage, right? Yeah, right? He could have come to Munich Security to talk about a number of things, but he chose to be on a stage with the Indian foreign minister. What does that say to you? Well, it says that he has in his mind also that our own foreign policy priorities in the region, and so for him that is important, and, and India is an important partner, so of course he would want that. But I also think that for the German foreign minister, they too are looking, trying to look at the global challenges beyond Europe beyond Germany. And those global challenges are ones where we have to w work together. And so I think that that's what it's showing. They really are trying to change their focus, I believe. But as I said, I would have loved to hear a little more in that discussion. Well, to put things in context, uh, because you did mention, I mean, both of you mentioned about the choices. Uh, Jay Shankar was asked that you do have a lot of, it seems like you have a lot of choices because you don't really choose to be with America or with a certain country at one point in time. And he said, um, I'm quoting loosely now, <laughs> he said, good partners offer a lot of good choices and smart partners take all the choices yeah, that are good. Yeah. So India being the smarter one there. Now, you said uh, that the West wants India to be together, you know, with them when it is about global conflicts. I really want to understand what is it that India brings to the table? What is it that despite India's rejection? I mean, Jay Shankar has been very vocal about it. He said it multiple times that India is non-West. India is not anti-West, but it is non-West. And despite that, we see West going back to India times and again. Why is that so? You know, let me put it this way. Um, I think in the Indian imagination today, and Jashankar has spoken about it several times in the past, that India plays the role of a bridge um, in the contemporary international system. You have the global south on the one hand, which a lot of people in the West uh, think that it should be retired. The term should be retired. You have the global south, you have the global north, you have the developing world, you have the developed world, you have the east, you have the west, you have the, um, 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 you know, you have, you have, and Asia, which is, which is rising, which is going to be playing a prominent role in the international system. 
China, I don't think, is keen on playing a bridge role in that sense. China is quite clear in my, in my sort of understanding that it wants to erect an alternative world order in the international system. Um, one of the reasons why China is courting the global south, and I did a piece for foreign affairs a couple of weeks ago in which I argue that China is trying to build an empire of influence in the global south. Um, now, when, it, when you look at India, what is India trying to do? India is courting the global south. India held two back-to-back -back global south summits in Delhi in 2023. Um, and, you know, it, it had an attendance of 130 uh, uh, countries each in each of those two um, um, global south summits. Uh, what is it trying to do? It's trying to basically say, here is a reality, and that is called the global south, uh, and they have genuine concerns and grievances. Mm -hmm. You go to listen to them. One of the such grievances, for example, is the fact that the COVID vaccine patents still have not been waived for um, uh, for much of the humanity, right? I mean, uh, what about debt restructuring? Uh, what about climate change financing? Um, all of these concerns, who is going to talk about it? The West is preoccupied with Ukraine, rightly so. I, I mean, I have no disagreements with, with that. I've been to Ukraine twice in the last, uh, last one year. Um, the West is preoccupied with uh, what is happening in Israel, Palestine, but there are a lot of other issues. Someone has to be talking about this. So India, in that sense, takes these concerns and you know uh, showcases them in G G20 or in the Global mm -hmm. South Summit or in G7 Plus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Someone has to do that. China is not doing that. Um, then there is the question of um, East and West in some ways. Uh, there is the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. That's a great power rivalry between Russia and the United States and the West, as it were. One, of, one country that is able to talk to both sides or all sides involved is India, right? I mean, uh, here is another country that, that is India, is able to have a conversation with the military government in uh, Myanmar, able to have a conversation with uh, the Taliban. When, they left, when the West left Afghanistan in 2021, August, uh, we were there to pick up the pieces. So, you know, you have to have countries like India in order to reach out to the undesirables, in order to reach out to the farthest corners of the planet, to sort of talk a uh, language they understand mm -hmm. and appreciate. I think that bridge role is important, which China is unable to play. But the countries in Global South also have varied <coughs> interests. It's not like uh, there's this one set of interests and India as a leader of the Global South can take that burden and, you know, move forward. So. I don't see that kind of unity in Global South. I see that the country is there, each one. I mean, India says we'll do what is good for us, rightly yeah. so. Uh, but most of the countries in Global South are also using the same principle that this is important for us, we'll do this. And then how does India, as the so-called leader of Global South, put everyone together and put those interests in front and say, OK, this is more important, and then we'll talk about everything later? Absolutely. Today's Global South is interest-driven. It, it is not driven by ideology. It is not driven by an anti-Western um, motivation or anti-Americanism. That's the big difference between the Global South of the 70s and the 80s and the 60s to the Global South of 2022. Um, right? You should note that Jay Shankar, Indian Prime Minister, has not been attending the G77 summits or the um, NAM, the Non-Aligned movement summits for the last, what, 10 years? But the Indian uh, Prime Minister did um, chair the Global South Summit in Delhi. There is a message there. What is the message? That we are making a distinction between the NAM and G77 on the one hand and the Global South on the other. The, and because NAM has an ideological sort of origin, G77 has an ideological origin, Global South does not have an ideological origin. So they're making a distinction. They're saying it is about interests, it is about coalitions of the willing, it is about, you know, you see a problem, a challenge, let's come together, face it. When nobody listens to you, let's listen to each other. I think that's the objective here. To that actually, it's not, it's not a question of leadership. It's a question of someone who is willing to convene. What is leadership? Is leadership about uh, monopoly of um, an idea? No, it's about convening. It is about um, ensuring that people are listened to. It's about um, giving a space for people to come together and talk to each other. That's leadership. If that is leadership, India is taking that leadership. Robin, I'm curious, how you just made a, had a lot of keywords there, interests uh -huh. over values, coalitions of the willing. Is that traditionally, the traditional alliance, US and Europe, is values-based? Mm -hmm. um, is in more, a move to an interest-based alliance where sometimes they're with you, sometimes they're not. Is that something that you think the U.S. is ready to sign up to? Can't speak for the whole U.S., but I'll give it a go. <laughs> so here, I actually think that the, these are not 
choices that are apart, but things that would work together. Okay, we have alliances, our transatlantic alliance. This is a defensive alliance based in NATO, so it, so it is a, actually a military alliance in, in addition to everything else. But if you take it more broadly, yes, of course, it is a values-based alliance. But, you know, we have these, these structured alliances, and then we have the things we do together that are maybe more issue-driven. Here's an issue, how do we solve that? Can we solve it within, is it appropriate to solve it within that alliance? Or is it more easily solved if we are able to pull together like-minded, maybe from within that alliance or add in some others and really put our minds to doing that and trying to solve that? And so I think that we are actually coming to this, this point where we are having we have alliances, and those are really important, and we really do need to tend them because mm -hmm. we, we can imagine what happens when we don't, right? And we need the tools that those alliances have put together and developed over time. Uh, we can deploy those tools, and there may be times when we need to, and they're important for or for consultation. But there come some issues where you think, okay, right, vaccine diplomacy, all right. This is, this is something we really saw in the pandemic, and it is maybe harder for some than others to solve. So trying to look at that with Indian leadership, that could, that could really push something forward, and we're gonna need that because there will be another crisis where we need to make sure that we have vaccines. We've already seen, if you, you, know, if you look at it as AIDS it was a pandemic, then you, we've already had two pandemics that were, ver were really very widespread. Um, and Ebola we didn't only because it was more geographically contained. But it gives us our challenge for the future. And that's where I think that really India has that role to play. And you see that having some of those flexible coalition of the willing alliances that are a little more deployable, a little faster, mm -hmm. they're not as heavy a tanker that, that you know is hard to turn, but something that can sail and say, hmm, maybe we can come up with that solution. So are we moving towards a world where America does not lead? So how come the choice is either America is leading <laughs> with these tankers or, or, or we're doing coalitions? I really think that it's, it's layers, right? Because if, if, I, if I said to you, oh, well, of course, uh, America doesn't need to lead, that I don't think that would be true, but it would also suggest that we have to lead on everything. And I think that if we are good allies and partners, then we are actually listening and working with each other and working with the partners that can bring solutions most effectively. And, and I think that it, it's not a choice of traditional alliances or not, or American leadership or not. It's let's bring it to solving the problem. And, and that is definitely what we've been hearing from the likes of Anthony Blinken. It's not all or nothing. We are willing to work with countries like India on certain issues, even though if you're not with us for all issues. Is that message getting across to Indian policymakers? What, at least in, in communication from the US, they're willing to be open to that kind of interest-based, issue-by-issue alliance. I think so. I think um, the Americans and the um, other Indian partners in general have realized that here is a country that um, wishes to foreground its interests, um, not that it is saying that we are not driven by values at all. Mm -hmm. um, but when stark distinctions or, or, or let's say uh, distinctions are made between values and interests that, hey, uh, either you're with democracies or with non-democracies, I think that's when you know things start uh, becoming a difficult proposition for India. But I think this distinction between values and interests uh, is also sometimes an artificial one. Um, for example, uh, we talk about the free and open Indo-Pacific. Is that a value or an interest? It is a, it's an interest, which is also a value. So values, interests can over time become values. After all, interests um, uh, theoretically are values, uh, where values at a certain point of time. So, you know, I think we don't need necessarily need to sort of bend over backwards to make that artificial distinction. That is artificial. So. I think that message has been received in India. We need to look for certain convergence of interest. And there are, there are far, there is a lot of convergence of interest between the United States and India um, in the region and beyond. Um, China being one, one major uh, component of that convergence of interest, Indo-Pacific being the other one, uh, or the neighborhood being the other one. 
Um, gone are the days when the Americans would come to Delhi and tell um, the decision makers, you go to sort of, uh, um, you know, do X, Y, Z. I think those days are gone. Th today is the age of consultation. But what changed? A change, I mean, several things, of course. The American primacy in the international system has um, somewhat um, um, reduced, uh, not somewhat, greatly reduced, especially within the region, in Asia, especially in the South Asian region. The Americans are simply not there, that's one. Um, secondly, uh, you are looking at a multipolar world today, which may be headed towards a bipolar world between China and the United States. But in the meantime, you, you have several more poles in the international system, India being one such pole. And thirdly, I think the rise of India's own power in the region and beyond. Right? I mean, here is a country that is, well, of course, it's only $4 trillion economy versus China's $17.5 trillion and the United States' twenty four point or $25 a trillion dollar economy, and yet it is the fifth largest economy. Um, it, um, you know, if, if you look at the, the, I mean, maybe I can come back on the rise of India question later on, but I think the rise of India has also contributed to uh, the recognition in DC that here is a country that we go to sort of deal with, talk to, and, and can do business with. Why not? So I think it's a combination of factors. And is that going to remain the same in case Trump comes back? I'm no, not, I, I, am, <laughs> I am not going to be predictive. Okay? Did you but not I, bring your crystal ball? <laughs> no, I didn't. And we you told know, you to bring it. Uh, well, it was pretty fogged up. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, what I will say is that, you know, t it, if you look at countries' interests, right, if you, um, it's also worth saying, okay, so there are some things in, um, in the U.S. policy, I even with our European allies, that were hardy perennial issues to, that needed to be solved, right? And so in some ways you can predict that if something is a, is a scratchy issue now, it could be a scratchy issue in another administration, right? So it's worth addressing those scratchy issues uh, because they will need to be solved regardless. Um, and so that's the best I can do is to say, depending on what happens in our elections, it's worth taking a look at the issues we can cooperate on and work on together in the now and in the and, and then because it is we if we have the capability to bring uh, our our a solution to it then we should and regardless of what happens in november none of us have have that crystal ball isha you asked the, the question about us leadership is it there is it disappearing Regardless, but, but happy one, you've talked about now this multipolar world. So is India, regardless of what happens with U.S. leadership, it's probably not going away anytime soon, is India willing to step up, in, if, if that's true, about a multipolar world and lead in its own right? What does your crystal ball say? <laughs> about, about the elections or about the <laughs> no, let's, let's just stick yeah. to the much easier we'll question about, elections, US, about yeah. Indian leadership. Yeah. You know, I think, I think India's, India's, the rise of India has to be put in certain perspective. I'll take two minutes to sort of tell you my, my mm. take on the rise of India. I think it's a, there are, there are several paradoxes here. Uh, paradox number one, um, India's rise globally is coinciding with India's decline regionally. Mm. If you look at India in South Asia, uh, there is, I mean, South Asia as an idea is disappearing in many ways. It's becoming Southern Asia. Um, mm. You know, China is coming in, the sort of canvas is getting um, larger and larger. Um, the Pakistanis are looking towards the Middle East, for example. Um, many of the other South, South Asian countries are looking towards China or Southeast Asia. India is looking at Indo-Pacific and Europe. Mm -hmm. So the traditional uh, post-British uh, Raj, um, you know, space in South Asia, which we, which became the, the you know, India became the legacy state of the British Empire. It became the um, uh, subcontinent and South Asia. All that. All that is really a thing of the past, as it were. So India is declining regionally, but India is rising globally. So that's challenge number one, the paradox number one. Secondly, uh, yes, it is a, um, in, in sort of um, you know, gross national power terms, it is a major power to reckon with. And yet we have hundreds of millions of people who are under the poverty line. Um, so at a time when there is a foreign policy or defense crisis, India will be able to muster that power and sort of put that to use. But at the same time, on a daily basis, India will not be able to um, you know, contribute to the global commons, um, contribute to sort of uh, uh, making lives better elsewhere when you go to make lives uh, better at home within India. That's paradox number two. Uh, paradox number three, uh, India's rise is in some ways coinciding with China's uh, stupendous rise uh, globally and regionally for the first time in India's history ever before. 
Um, never before have we had a superpower rising in our neighborhood. And here is a, here is a superpower rising in our neighborhood with aggressive intentions. So you may be rising, but there is someone rising next door with, with far greater power and far um, stronger ambitions. So I think given this complexity, or let's say given, this, given, the, given the confluence of several paradoxes here about India's rise, one has to be careful about what to expect from India. Now, if you expect India to mil spend million, billions of dollars in Africa uh, or in Southeast Asia, it's just not India's, uh, you know, India simply cannot do that. It just doesn't have that kind of uh, money to do that. Whereas, if you say, all right, let's get into some kind of trilateral cooperation, the Germans, Indians, and uh, say, um, doing some work in South Asia, or Americans and Indians doing some work in Southeast Asia, or Japanese and Indians doing some work in, um, in Africa, absolutely. Um, so I think we, we will have to sort of moderate and manage expectations as to what to expect from a rising India. How, where does that fall then on, for example, the, the Red Sea Alliance in w what the U.S. is now leading to keep sea lanes open and safe? Is th that might be an example of where India works with countries, to your example. <laughs> example. I know I think probably that's not a great example because I think India had its own reasons as to why it did not want to join that uh, um, uh, that that alliance. I mean to begin with traditionally India has always said that uh, we will only join um, you know coalitions of that kind if it is under the UN uh, mandate mm -hmm. not under the American leadership. India is not going to put its soldiers um, under the sort of command of another country. I think that's been the case in Afghanistan or in Iran, Iraq, etc. Uh, for that matter. So I think that's problem number one. And problem number two, not really problem number two, but the point number two really is that India has its own access to Tehran. Um, India did send uh, Minister Jay Shankar uh, to Tehran to talk to the uh, foreign minister there, to the national security advisor there. So uh, what Americans don't have in the region, sometimes India has. So you don't necessarily have to fall into a category and say so we'll stand with the Americans and the West as far as this question is concerned. Also, India does not necessarily share the American or the Western position on the Gaza issue. So uh, there are several, I think, uh, pieces uh, which sort of require India to take a slightly different position, which it, which it did. Um, there are some attacks on India, uh, on the Indian ships, and Indians have deployed uh, naval presence uh, in the region. I think things have sort of uh, uh, not gone all that bad for India. India's marketing pitch, if I may take the liberty to t say that, at the moment is that of being a Vishwa Guru, right. the guru of the whole world, the teacher of the whole world. What is it exactly that India wants to teach the world? You know, uh, two points. One, the whole Vishwa Guru argument is nothing new. I mean, in fact, I just finished writing a book, which I hope to publish by the end of this year. Um, it's called After Non-Alignment. And if you look at, and I've, I've looked at 100 years of India's foreign policy history, diplomatic history, which is even before India became independent, from 20s to 30s to 40s, the Indian leadership consistently made the argument that we are in a position to teach the world through moral examples, through the power of uh, um, civilizational morality, that this and the other, Gandhi, Nehru, Patel, all of these people have spoken about it. So it's not Prime Minister Narendra Modi or the BJP talking about it today. They may be talking about it today to suit a political purpose. Marketing it, that's, it's marketing. that's why. It's but this, this thinking in India that we are a different kind of power goes a very, very long way, uh, at least a hundred years. Uh, the second aspect of that is that if you look at um, Jaisinger's latest book, uh, Why Bharat Matters, or some of his latest arguments, the Vishu Guru argument does not come out, uh, come across uh, very often. What comes out quite frequently is Vishwamitra argument, that we are a friend to the world, we are a friend of everybody in the international system. So I think you are looking at a certain transition taking place within India on its own role in the international system. And again, in the book that I am um, writing, I make the argument that for at least a hundred years, Indians have, um, on the one hand, um, Indians, have may, Indians have always thought that they are a great power, that we are a power, we can make a difference to the international system, we can shape the global order in many positive ways. Indians have always, on the other hand, said that we are non-aligned, meaning we won't do this, we don't want that, we don't like this. That's a very reactionary, even non-alignment, even, even strategic autonomy is strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis somebody. It's a, it's a reactionary concept. What is at the heart of this reactionary approach in the Indian sort of political thinking? We won't do this. We can't do this. We don't like that. Why? Because we don't want to be with somebody else. We want to be on our own. We are a great power. 
how can a how can a country that believes itself to be a great power be an appendage to somebody else so non alignment is there because india believed itself to be a great power um oh, so marketing pitch it is but it's a very old marketing pitch <laughs> nothing new that sounds like a, there seems like to be a fine line between non alignment and not dependent and isolationism mm. where mm -hmm. which is where at least one strain of us politics is going right now um how what might be an american response to this idea of kind of we're we're, we're powerful enough to be on our own that actually is a criticism that of, of, of that train of US politics. Yeah, I'm, I actually was fascinated. You saw me kind of leaning into the, to this argument and so forth, because I'm trying to think about how that, how that changes the, the way that we in, would interact together. And I, I will say that I think every country has within it the, uh, a strand of thinking that is, well, can we do this on our own? Sp particularly if you, are, if you have a richness of geography and, uh, and people and so forth. And, so I, and I speak in that of my own country as well. Right? Uh, so it's possible to sometimes say, OK, well, maybe we, maybe we could take a break. Or you know, maybe we don't need to be as engaged. But I think that, in fact, you find that you always are engaged. The world just doesn't work in the way that allows for absolute non-engagement. What you're describing is a philosophy of how you engage, right? And so isolating, not engaging, that's really not an option in a world where we are so linked. Um, and again, I go back to the pandemic because I don't think anything showed us how much we are linked like the pandemic did, right? Or climate change, how much we are linked together, and how one thing can change all of our trading patterns, all of our, our travel patterns. And so when you look at it that way, there, you can't really do that. I think for some it can be an attractive idea because you think, oh, can we take care of building at home? Um, can we look inward for a while? But it, I, I think it's a false look because so much of what you're doing is is linked to what you want to do with what you what you build internally as uh, as well. So that that's how I look at it. And and frankly, uh, it's why I was so intrigued as you were talking, Happy Mom, because I thought, oh yeah, I can see how this this is a definition that would allow us to actually work well as partners. Can I just comment on that? Uh, you know, what I was saying was not that India is trying to be isolationist. What I'm trying to say is that India does not join um, blocks or coalitions or alliances because it thinks that you can't, a great power or a self-assumed great power cannot be playing second fiddle to another great power or superpower, mm -hmm. as it were. That's why it kept a distance from all these such blocks throughout the Cold War and even now. That does not mean that India doesn't realize the importance of um, joining certain coalitions as and when there is a necessity. Mm -hmm. Quad is an example. Mm -hmm. Chips for, I mean, um, um, Malabar exercises um, or BRICS or SCO or, you know, name it. But India also makes a choice as to what kind of groupings it wants to be mm -hmm. part of. For example, it does not want to be part of, at least at this point of time, um, a, a NATO plus arrangement. Uh, it doesn't want to be part of any such uh, arrangement which will mean kinetic military action in a, in a different theater like the Red Sea Alliance. So it picks and chooses. Uh, mm -hmm. that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't want to be uh, part of any of these groupings. Uh, look at India. India is part of G7 plus, G20, um, BRICS, SCO, RIC, name it. You know, it's all there. Um, so isolationism is probably not what you're seeing. What you're seeing is a desire to pick and choose. Um, as, as again, uh, was it Jaisangar or um, in the, in the uh, session that we were talking about, if you are not at the table, you are in the menu. That uh, was Blinken. That <laughs> is Blinken. Uh, pretty much the case. You know, why people, a lot of people ask India, why do you want to be part of um, SCO, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, when you're also part of um, the Quad and the G20, etc. SEO is a neighborhood sort of gathering, right? And you have the Pakistanis there, you have China, you have Russia there, mm -hmm. Central Asians there. If India is not part of that, then they're going to sort of decide things for the region without India being at the table. It makes perfect sense for India to be at the table, while at the same time being at the table of the Quad. So, you know, 
I think location and geography is destiny. You can't sort of do away with that. And I think prior to where it is, the Indians have to make those, I think, um, you know, choices of you know, this kind. And speaking of location and geography, Europe, or should I be more specific, the European Union has often felt very far from the Indo-Pacific region. We're not thinking they need, really need policy. Given that you are the global, global <laughs> Europe, <laughs> right. where, where is Europe? Where is Europe in the globe uh, on these matters? Well, you know, Europe is really engaging, and this is what I've seen over time. You know, as, uh, it's engaging more and more, and partly because, again, the challenges are these global challenges, right? Uh, people used to ask me, Robin, why, what are all these people in your embassy doing, right? <laughs> are relations so bad that we need, you know, this staff? And I, mostly what we're doing is talking about what we do together elsewhere, um, mm -hmm. addressing common problems and issues that, that we share. And sometimes that was work we were doing together in the NATO alliance. Sometimes that was work we were, we were doing uh, with refugees and migrants that were coming through Europe. Sometimes it was, oh, what are we doing to try and stop terrorism? There are a whole range of things that we did with our European partners. And it was really broad, and so it, people would wonder why we were, set, we were talking about Syria so much, because, well, you know, that was, a big, that was a very big issue, and we wanted to work with our allies and partners on this together, and the same was true in Iraq. So there are a whole range of things where we, where we look at it in that way. And s Europe has also broadened its perspective, and I think this conference is really showing just how much they're doing that. I love the fact that they started off with the, with the panel with Antonio de Guterres and mm. with the, with the uh, president of Colombia and the president of Ghana, uh, Prime Minister Barbados. This, mm. was, this was a panel that would not in past years have been the opening session of the Munich Security Conference, which would have been much more internally focused. And I think they're reshaping it because of the recognition that it, these relationships are shaping Europe too, and that's important. So that's a symbol of reshaping of the global world order. Reshaping of how, how Europe is participating and the transatlantic relationship plays into all of this. Um, your, your question is even bigger, the whole shaping of the global world order. That, I think, is, uh, is something that, of course, Europe, the United States, and others are all grappling with. What is what are these changes in how alliances operate? What are these multi-layered alliances doing? And, uh, and how is that affecting how we work together? But ultimately, I think it's about problem solving. <laughs> you have these problems, what can you bring to it? Can you, and can you do it issue by issue so that it is not, I think you were saying that the, the, the approach is not ideological so much as, uh, so much as practical. And, and if you can look at these issues and see what you can do together, then that seems to me a more practical way forward. So the problem solving strategies would need to be changed. I mean, both of you mentioned uh, the pandemic and the vaccines, for example. And uh, I remember at that time, West wasn't willing to share vaccines. Mm -hmm. And that's where India pitched in. And of course, that's what we've been hearing now so often that, um, the West gave India and the Global South a chance to think, OK, we really got to come together now. Mm. And if that was a lesson for the West that, no, as you said, the problem solving strategy mm -hmm. needs to be different. We can't just keep looking internally. Mm -hmm. We got to do this together because, of course, it's a pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. which other problem would involve the whole world? Mm -hmm. With Ukraine, India would say it's your matter. We d have nothing to do with it. But a pandemic is a problem that the whole world mm -hmm. has to deal with together. And there you saw that no, we'll use our vaccines and you make your own. And then India is like, okay, that's where the Vishwa Guru comes in, that we're going to sell it or not even sell it. We're going to give it to others and show that we can lead. Mm -hmm. So I'm just giving that example mm -hmm. that going by that example, will West have to change strategies about how to solve problems, global issues, wherever they may be? I think we're already changing them in that we're opening ourselves up to, to working together in ways that are flexible. Um, and I'd like to see that continue. Because I, like you, I focus on the pandemic because here is this problem that involves us all. And I think we could have done better. I think a lot of people probably <laughs> think that. <laughs> yeah. and but, but if we don't learn from that, and some, some of that might be also 
what can we do um, in terms of looking at how international organizations that like the WHO, do, they, do we need to have a look at how they work and how they reform? That would be a, like the tanker of the, uh, you know, the, an institutional body. It, c is there more flexibility that, that we could institute in that way? Um, so all of these are, are questions that are open, but I think we need to address them because we, we surely know that there will be another pandemic of some sort or, or another issue of some sort that it look that looks like this and needs all of our all of our intelligence to solve it. Yeah, you're scaring us all. I think right. I think that's called climate change. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yes, I, th I, I mean I was thinking of climate change yeah. actually because it's just you have to look you have to look at what that challenge is right and and it, it would, would be better if we were working together on it. So if we're already preparing for the next problem, that brings me back to the question where we started this whole discussion. Where does India stand in that new global order? Well, I think uh, where India stands, let, let me sort of, sort of unpack that somewhat differently. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about um, the fact that today the international order is crumbling, there is a problem of chaos in the international system, et cetera, et cetera. You know, sitting in New Delhi, we feel that um, a chaotic international system is not bad after all. Um, you know, if there was no chaotic international system, nobody would have asked New Delhi's opinion. Um, they would have told what their opinion was, and New Delhi would have to do that. So, as E.H. Carr would say, the um, status quo is made by the victors, um, yes. and the losers have no stake in that status quo. So, when there is anarchy, when there is chaos, uh, you know, people in the global south, uh, people in India would say, well, it's our time to speak up. Uh, we will put our interests across, we'll take them what we think should be the shape of the world order. So to that extent, you know, I think there is a certain sense of enthusiasm, there's a certain sense of uh, um, optimism that we can and we will be able to contribute to the international order, um, you know, conceptually speaking. But at the same time, are the global institutions willing to accept India as an equal partner? The UNSC, for example, um, you know, Italy is a member of G7. India is not, compared to the economies, you know, I leave that statistic, statistic to you. Um, or other global forums for that matter. So it's not just enough to expect India to perform. You should also accommodate India in some of the global institutions. But I can tell you this, um, you know, being there, being an analyst of uh, Indian foreign policy, there's a great deal of optimism and enthusiasm in Delhi to engage the world more, world order more proactively and contribute to its stability going forward. So on that optimistic note, we got to bring the show <laughs> to its end. We've been taking a lot of your time, and it was really fun. I mean, it, I think it's not too often where we discuss international relations, and um, it's so much fun that we <laughs> feel like we can go on for the next one hour. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. If you're watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. What do you think about the new global order? I'm Isha Bhatia San, and I'm senior editor at Deutsche Welle. And I'm William Glucrup, security reporter for DW. It was really wonderful having both our wonderful guests here, Robin Quinville of the Wilson Center, and how do you want to, uh, Jacob. Jacob. Thank you. Well, it's been a long hour, right? It's been, <laughs> yes. Uh, and you, a policy analyst. It's uh, been a fun I'm, hour. I'm left, feeling, uh, I'm left feeling somewhat hopeful about, you know, the world <laughs> order chaos, right? For all matter of perceptions. And I'm hopeful about the next podcast now after this. Oh, good. <laughs> good. I'll see you there. <laughs> Bye. Global Arms, a new take on security policy by DW.